Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search, brought to you by VIP. I'm your host, Casey Haston. I'm the director of recruiting with VIP. I'm also an executive recruiter, and I like to define myself as your all-around hiring guru. And I'm so very glad you're joining us this morning. Today on the show, I would like to welcome Mark Hirschberg, CTO, speaker, author, and wait for it, MIT instructor. Mark is the author of the Career Toolkit, which provides essential skills for success that no one ever taught you. Mark's goal is to show you how to design and execute your personal plan to achieve the career you deserve. Thanks for joining us today, Mark. Thanks for having me on the show. It's my pleasure to be here. Guess where I was this morning? Recruiting. You know what? I have not recruited all day today. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the third Wednesday of the month is a very special day for me because that is my big networking day. So it's with an organization called Success North Dallas. And I volunteer there and because I believe in the organization so much. So I have been up since 430 you have my sympathies. I hate early mornings. <laughs> it is. I, I won't lie. I needed some caffeine earlier before we started recording because this is later in the afternoon, actually. So, um, but thank you so much for joining me. And I love that every now and then a little nugget gets dropped in my emails. So, having said that, would you mind sharing with our audience how we got connected? We were connected through another podcaster, Nicole Jansen who when I spoke to her said, you should go on this podcast because this is all about career seekers and people could really use your advice in creating that career they want. I love that. Yeah, and then you filled out our form on the landing page, which, you know, I'll tell you something, it's kind of divine that we're here today because for some reason, a lot of times that goes to my junk mail. And I try to make sure that I check it and so that I keep on top of it, but I'm not gonna lie, I've probably missed some. So when I say that there was a little nugget in my email, it was you. And this is an important reminder that we need to pay attention to those little details, whether it's checking the junk box or seeing that emails are reaching us because you never know when that one email could lead to a podcast interview or your next job. Oh, so good, so good. How often do you check your junk mail? I check for my work, I check it every day. Really? So I try to get more than once a day. For my personal email, that now gets hundreds of things and I've kind of given up on that. I've given up on my personal email, period. I have like 20,000 emails, unread emails in my Gmail. And I'm just like, I just can't. I don't want to do it, you know? I have to look at emails all day long. A friend of mine one day declared email bankruptcy where she took all her unread emails she just marked them as read or moved them to the archive folder and said, email bankruptcy, inbox zero, go. Is that okay? Is that something we can do? I, I think so. I think like normal bankruptcy, there are consequences because maybe there's an email <laughs> five minutes ago you needed that you didn't pay attention to, but it might be worth trying. Just take go to the start of this year or start of this month and just put everything before that into your... I'm done folder and see how it goes. That is such great advice. Not what I thought we were going to talk about today, but I just have to say that, you know, I was starting to clean it out. um, I don't know, a few months ago before I just finally gave up. And my boyfriend was like, he's like, why are you doing that? And I was like, well, there might be something important in here. And he's like, if it was important, you've already missed it, you know, (laughs) so just get rid of it. That that is true. It's a Marie Kondo. If it ain't sparking oh, joy, her. time to drop it. Thank you. You've been a good part of my world. <laughs> but time for Wait. you to go. <laughs> I love that you brought her up. Okay. So Mark, tell me a little bit about yourself and your career journey. I have a very interesting dual career. Mm-hmm. I started out in the 90s during the dot-com era, coming out of MIT and beginning as a software developer. 
I realized early on that I wanted to become a CTO, a chief technology officer. And what was immediately clear is I couldn't just say, well, I'm an engineer and if I gain more experience, I'll be a bigger engineer and call myself CTO. To get to those senior jobs, to become an executive or even mid-level management, there are a number of other skills we need. Leadership, networking, negotiating, team building, interviewing, communication, and others, but no one ever teaches them to us. So I saw a gap in my skill set. I began to upskill myself. As I did so, I realized these skills are not just for executives, not just for managers. They are for everyone down to individual contributors. So I began to upskill my team. Now, as I was doing this, MIT had done some surveys of companies and they found companies are asking for these very skills, but can't find them. This, by the way, is not unique to MIT. We've seen similar surveys from, co from colleges across the US. And it's not just for new college grads. This is universal for everyone, different industries and levels. These are the skills they want, but they're not being taught. So at MIT, we created the Career Success Accelerator Program. And for the past 20 plus years, in addition to building tech startups and helping Fortune 500s innovate, I've also been teaching at MIT and now the book, the speaking and the app that go along with it. That is amazing. And you are so right that so many of these skills are not taught to, uh, to you know, students. I, you know, I, I belong to, um, or I'm actually an advisor on the board to a group called the Young Executives. And it's just, they're so hungry for this information, but there's nobody out there that teaches them. And I, the only way I know how to teach them is I let them shadow me. I'm like, let's go network. Let's go do this. This is how you get this done. And you have to ask my mentor. And I say this on almost every podcast. My mentor always tells me, get your ask in gear. Shadowing is a great way to do it. One of the mistakes is that we take a leadership class or read a leadership book, for example, or networking or any of these. And I'm a person who's written that book and that's great, but it's kind of like, if you want to learn to play basketball, well, I'll hand you the rule book. You should learn the rules, but then we don't say, well, you're done. You know what to do. Okay. Now go play in the NBA finals. You have to do it. You have to practice. You have to drill. You have to get feedback. And that's what we need to do in our professional development is we can't just read books and listen to podcasts. Yes, do so as someone who wrote a book and goes on podcasts, I do encourage that, but that's the start, not the end of it. And so you need to go further and do similar things to what we do at MIT. What's done at top business schools is to create these peer learning groups where you engage with other people and you go deeper on the topics. And that's going to help you better understand and develop these skills. I love that. And, and I, it's like a peer teaching. I love what you just said there. So, you know, you've mentioned your book. So I just, in, in being a soon to be published author, I get this too. So, I, and I know what inspired me, but what inspired you to write the Career Toolkit? Having taught it for over two decades at MIT, said, I know there are more people who need this. I know it's not just MIT students. It's the people who I've trained and coached and mentored, the ones I've led in my companies. It's lots of dates I've bored by talking about <laughs> career stuff when they weren't super interested. Maybe we should talk you know about what? that it, offline. <laughs> <laughs> it's time I reach a larger audience because I know the impact this can have and I want to help more people. You know, I, I feel like you and I have a similar passion in that we both want to help people not only get into a career, but get into the right career, right? And I feel like you know, your book, as, as you go through that, it's also a, a, some inner work. It's some self-development, some self, you know, discovery as to what might really be your calling. Would you agree with me? Is that kind of what it does? It does. So chapter one is how to create and execute a career plan. Because too many people say, I'm at this job today, and here's the job I want in 10 years. I want that director title, VP title. Mm -hmm. They just look at the title and think, well, that will make me happy. And now if it will, great. And in chapter one, we explain how you can create a plan and execute on it to get you where you want to go. Simply sitting around and hoping you get there doesn't usually work. So you have to be proactive. But if you're not sure where you want to go, 
then start with the questions. And the questions, by the way, not only are they in chapter one, they're downloadable for free on the resources page of my website. I have a whole bunch of free resources. I just give them away. I don't even ask for your email. I just want you to take them and use them. Wow. But it starts with the questions like, do you want to manage other people or be managed or be independent? Do you care about making lots of money? Do you care about flexibility? Do you care about time with your family? And it starts by understanding not just the job. Do you want to work with computers or not? Do you like dealing with other people? Sure, that's important. But it's understanding your life because you want to create a career that fits into your life instead of trying to create a life scheduled around your job. I think that is so important. And I think that's a lot of times where you know people will find, find that dissatisfaction because they didn't properly align with the job or even the core values of a company. And I think knowing those and knowing that about yourself will help you find that greater career satisfaction going forward. We also find two other problems is what's on paper and then what's the reality. Mm. So a very common mistake we see people going into law because when you're 12 years old and you think, oh, I want to be a lawyer because I see it on TV and that looks fun and exciting. And you get that courtroom drama. How is that not exciting? When you actually become a lawyer, you don't have courtroom drama. In fact, most lawyers don't even set foot in a courtroom. They're sitting in their office by themselves, redlining documents or sitting on three hour long calls with an angry client. That's not what you signed up for. That's not what you thought it was because the actual job is very different than what we perceive the job to be. So it's very important to understand, what do I actually do? And talk to people in those roles. I'm a CTO. Now at some companies, a CTO might be hands-on doing some coding, or it might be you're just focused on making sure the engineering works. At other companies, I don't really do a lot of coding these days. Yes, I have to make sure the engineering works. I also spend a lot of time talking to customers, going out to conferences, working our strategic plan. Same title, very different job in terms of where I'm spending my time. Mm -hmm. And it's important to understand that that's not in most job descriptions. The other challenge we get is the nature of the job. And that's the culture. That's a culture, for example, where you do want open debate. And that's fine as long as it's not personal. And there's arguing back and forth that's different than a culture where you know, we're not big on debate here. And if you have an issue with someone's plan, talk to them one on one. And if you don't fit into that culture, if it's not your style, you might be great at the job, but you're not going to stylistically fit into the company. And that's going to be a failure for both sides. Okay. So the Career Toolkit emphasizes important success skills. You mentioned them earlier that most, most people are never taught. And I want to dig a little bit deeper into those because everyone should read your book, in my opinion. So why do you believe these skills aren't taught in schools? I mean, is this a must read for someone just starting out in their career? This is a must read at some point in your career. The earlier, the better. And mm -hmm. we can talk about why. But even people in their 30s, 40s, if you don't have these skills and want them, now's the time to get them. I have people even in their 50s and 60s saying, I wish I had this 20 years ago. So it's any time you need these skills, but earlier is better. To your question why it's not taught, high school is a relatively new invention. It goes back about 150 years. And that was necessary as we moved off of the farms into the factories. Before that, well, I just learned from dad and girls learned from mom because it was a sexist time. I didn't need any real higher learning. I just needed to know how to plow the field. Once we moved into the factories, once we started living in the cities, we need some additional skills. And that's what high school did. But you didn't need to be a great networker to work on the assembly line. Even the 1950s, when you were sitting in those rows of desks, think of those 1950 movies, your boss came up to you and said, do this work. Okay, yes, sir, do the work. Here you go, sir, I'm done. What next, sir? Okay, I'll do this next. And you were the cog in the machine. You just had to know your function, marketing, sales, engineering, whatever you did. When we fast forward to the end of the 20th century and we started to get flatter organizations when they eliminated middle management, when we got teams that were more dynamic, cross-functional teams, or now teams where you have the head of marketing, he might be 55 years old and saying, 
TikTok. We need TikTok. I don't really know TikTok. I haven't been on, but you, 25 year old, TikTok us. <laughs> he doesn't know more than the people working for him. And look, this is true for me as a CTO. I don't know all the details of all the technologies we use. I have to rely on my team to get answers as opposed to I'm telling you what to do and you do it. So it's a different set of skills. We have to use these other skills to communicate and work together better. Universities don't teach it because they're run by professors. And now professors are great people, but they are so narrow. They are experts in their area. And they say, oh, you wanna be a marketer? Take this class and that class and a few of these, and we will give you a degree saying, you know marketing. That's it. I'm not saying you're a good marketer. I'm certainly not saying you're a good employee. I'm just saying you have this level of marketing knowledge. And that was sufficient. Both of these organizations, high schools and universities, need to change, but that's going to be a 30-some year process. I agree. I, I totally agree with everything you've just said. And I wish that universities would take a more active role in helping, you know, young students, students just starting their career in really finding what they're wired to do, what's going to make them happy long term, instead of just saying, okay, you're an accountant, you're this, you're going to be an engineer, or even parents doing that to their kids, because that's their dream. Absolutely. And we need to help people think through their careers. When you think about the career planning we have, it's typically things like, do you want to be a doctor? Yes or no. Do you want to be an accountant? Yes or no. And really the way to think about it is to go back to the root components. Do you want to work in medicine? Yes or no. Do you want to meet lots of new people each day? Well, wait, I do like medicine, but I don't want to deal with someone new each day. Okay, maybe that's medical research. So I'm using my medical knowledge, which is interesting, but I'm not dealing with a different patient each day. It's the same team of people. So you don't just say doctor, yes or no, accountant, yes or no. Say what are the components that are interesting and then look for a job that lets you travel a lot and work with spreadsheets and do these six things. There's some job out there that probably lets you do it. Well, and what you said just kind of answers my next question because you are an expert in career planning. So just break it down for us. How important is career planning for someone just launching their career? Consider the following. You're at work, your CEO comes up to you and says, here is a major project. This is what you need to do in the next two years. So get it done. What do you do? Do you say, okay, great. I'm gonna go lock myself in my room for two years and I'll see you then and hopefully I get the project done on time. That would be insanity. Instead you say, let me get input from others who probably have done similar projects. I'm going to come up with a project plan and a timeline. I'm going to have checkpoints along the way. Am I on target? Am I getting off target? Things will change. If you've ever worked on a two-year project at work, you know it's going to change along the way. And you also know whatever plan you create is not the plan you actually execute. That's going to change too. Well, if we know for a two-year project at work, we absolutely positively need a plan and we need to do check-ins. We need to adjust. If that's necessary for two years, think about 20 years. Mm -hmm. Think about your whole career. How could you not have a plan for that? That's a really good point. And I will be honest, I did the exact opposite of what you just said. I've kind of flown by the seat of my pants through my entire career. And that's not a good thing. You know, I mean, Probably the last 10 years have been a little bit more directed, but prior to that, it was really just, uh, okay, well, you started doing this, so just go ahead and do this, you know? And that's how I got into a career I didn't love. So I love the advice that you're giving in really helping people to stop, think, and be very intentional about what you're doing in your career path. And I, I wish more people would do that. I think the world would be a much happier place for sure. So now let's, let's just talk about two things that trip people up when they do it. The first is they say, how can I possibly know what I'll be doing in seven years? Mm -hmm. Okay. You probably won't know exactly, but think of that two year project plan on day seven. Do you know what you're doing on day 452? Of course not. You have general placeholders and very importantly, you will adjust the plan as you go. So don't worry about getting it right. And remember that's not set in stone. If you asked me 25 years ago, would you ever do a book? Of course not, why would I do that? 
But along the way, as I was on my path to being a CTO, there was this opportunity to help create this class at MIT. So, okay, yeah, you know, I'll help them out. I didn't think it would lead to anything, but it turned into teaching there, it turned into the book. So we want to have our plan, but of course, adjust. Don't say no to opportunities. Ultimately, this is your plan. Make it work for you and adjust it as you need, but have a plan because without a plan, you're just floating in the wind. I do have a plan now, just so you know. Don't worry about me. I have a plan, <laughs> okay? But I mean, so tenured professionals, how, how can they plan the future of their career? Is it too late? It is never too late. As long as you have more than about two or three years in your career, as long as there's going to be at least one change in terms of a promotion, in terms of a new job, in terms of new responsibilities, you can create a plan. By the way, this is a common mistake I hear entrepreneurs say, you know, I don't need a plan. I'm the CEO. My job title doesn't change. And that's true. Your job title doesn't change. But what does change is what you work on, what you focus on, your development, your leadership, where you're spending your time. You still grow and change, even if your title doesn't. Okay, I want to get to a chapter in your book real quick um, that I thought was really interesting because you talk about unethical negotiating and specifically hard bargainers. How can a job seeker handle a hard bargainer when trying to negotiate ethically? Now, these are two related but slightly different things. You can be a hard bargainer and not unethical. You can be unethical without being a hard bargainer. Unethical is where you are actively lying or misrepresenting things in a negotiation. So a common technique, this is the classic used car salesman trope. We're negotiating, you're trying to buy that used car. I finally, we agree on some number. I'm pushing you down or uh, I'm pushing you up. You're trying to push me down. I, okay, we agree, you know, 15,000. Okay, great. Yeah, glad we got this done. Listen, I got to go talk to my manager. Mm. I come back, my manager, who might just be my friend in the room, who just killed a minute with me, so it looked like I spoke to my manager. Go, oh, yeah, sorry. Listen, I want to do this deal, but my manager says it's got to be at least 16,000. I've now negotiated in bad faith. That is just unethical. I should have said up front, by the way, any deal we come up with, we have to run by my manager. Hard bargaining is where you just get someone saying, no, 16, take it or leave it. Nope, I don't care. I'm not budging. You budge. I don't want to budge. Not unethical. It's annoying to deal with. With any negotiation, what we want to do is focus on the reason why. Okay, why is 16,000 so important? Maybe, for example, this person, he wants to buy his daughter a new car and 14,000 doesn't get the car he wants. It doesn't help him. His daughter's going to be pissed. And he says, nope, that, that won't get me out of the doghouse with her. I need at least 16. That might not be a good reason for a 16, but now at least you know the reason. Maybe you can say, hey, you know what? I've got a buddy who can let a similar car go cheaper for 15,000. You just deal with me, I'll introduce you to my buddy. So once you get to the why, you can start to find ways to meet the solution. But a lot of hard bargainers will not give you any indication of why, and that makes it hard to negotiate with them. And if someone's not giving you any, any leeway, any indication of where you might be able to do trade-offs, it might be time to just walk away. And that's important in any negotiation. Yeah, I think we see that most around, obviously, salary negotiations. Now, it's a little different when you're working with a recruiter because we do your salary negotiations for you. But I'll tell you, there are times when I have clients that come back and it's like, I mean, in the hardest times, just to kind of play off of that, is when, let's say a candidate's making 60000 they come in and they say, okay, we're going to give them 61000 Why would I make a move for that? And they're like, no, that's it. That's that's our budget. That's it. And I'm like, you're going to lose the candidate. That's not the right candidate for us. Okay. I put in every job offer, every contract, I cannot reveal my salary. I can't tell you what I'm making right now. It would violate my contract. The reason I put it in is because all too often, if I'm making 60, I go to another job, they say, oh, okay, well, 60 plus X. We'll yep. give you 63. We'll give you 4% more, whatever it is. No, you should pay me based on the value I deliver to you. The value I deliver to them is different. When I spent a year at Harvard Business School, it's academia. They don't pay a lot. 
Now I did when doing that, I sat three feet from a Harvard professor for a year. I got personal tutoring. Mm. I joked that Harvard business school paid me to learn finance and economics. That was more than the dollar amount that they were paying. But when I went for my next job, they said, oh, well, you made this, we'll pay you that. No, 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 you're not understanding. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah, other and, yeah. and other things doesn't matter. So I took it out. And it's not just, I don't want to tell you by putting it in my contract. And I've had people ask me, I will show you the redacted contract. I'll cross out the number and you'll see the rest of the contract where it says, I can't tell you that number. And now you have to decide what value I bring to your business and pay me based on that. And here's a hint, I think it's this. That's so interesting because you know, there's several states and I, I can't think of all of them off the top of my head. I believe New York's one, maybe California. New York City has that, yeah. Yeah, where employers, potential employers are not allowed, it's against the law for them to ask what your prior salary was. And I don't and think that's a bad thing. It, yeah, women especially, we know there's a wage gap. And fortunately, when you get, let's say a guy comes out of college at 60,000 and a woman comes out at 50,000, and then year after year, they go up 3% or they go up $5,000, she is always behind him. Mm -hmm. And so by saying clean slate each time, they hope to undo some of the wage gap. Well, I think that's one thing they're doing right. <laughs> All right. So what type of skills do you think are critical for success, no matter how experienced you are? There are 10 skills we have in the book broken into three sections. And these are not ones I came up with overnight. These are the ones we see time again in the surveys. So section one, career skills, how to create and execute a career plan. And even companies want you to have a sense of where do you want to go in your career? Chapter two, working effectively. Things like managing your manager, understanding corporate culture, corporate politics. Chapter three is interviewing, not simply as a candidate. There's lots of material on that out there, but many of us have to hire our coworkers or subordinates. No one's taught us how to do that. So how to interview and hire others. Second section is on leadership and management. There's a chapter on leadership and then one on the people side of management, one on the process side. Again, this is not just for people with senior titles or who formally manage others. If you ever have to work with a coworker on a project and say, well, why don't you do this and I'll do that? You're doing some management there. You might not have authority, you're using management skills. And then the third section, interpersonal dynamics, has communication, networking, negotiating, and ethics as chapters. Mm, ethics, that should be chapter one. <laughs> it really does need to be taught more often. I've read lots of business books and it's really sad when you think about it, the word ethics doesn't even appear in many of the books on leadership or on business. It's not really discussed and it needs to be because unfortunately we see more and more unethical behavior. We do. What's your best piece of advice that you can give current job seekers? To invest in these skills. Let me give you a simple example. Suppose right now you have a job offer for $60,000, but you've learned to negotiate. And if you have a recruiter doing it for you, great. Not everyone does. And there'll be times you're negotiating where you don't have one. So learn to negotiate. Now imagine you get that job offer. You spend five, 10 minutes negotiating on the phone or a couple emails and you go from 60 to 61. That's not a huge lift, but we can imagine it's doable. If you do nothing else, at 30 years old, you take this job and you sit there for the next 30 years, you've just earned in 10 minutes of work, a thousand dollars more for 30 years. 10 minutes just got you $30,000. But of course, you're not gonna stay in that job for 30 years. You'll have other raises, promotions, jobs. You're going to negotiate those for more than a thousand dollars. If you learn to negotiate, we're not talking about being the world's greatest negotiator, just getting a little bit better, you can add tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to your lifetime earning. And now here's the bigger secret. I use negotiating as an example, because we can do the math, $1,000, 30 years. But the same is true for your leadership, your communication skills, your networking. No one says, oh, you're a better communicator, here's $1,000 more. But you get noticed, you get the job, you get on the right project, you get promoted faster and you're going to see the same type of ROI. 
So with all of these skills, don't think, oh, I'm just terrible. These other people are so much better. If you get just a little bit better with any, or ideally all of these skills, you can have a huge impact on your career. I think that says it all right there. I think that's beautiful. So I just, I wanna encourage everybody to go out and read the Career Toolkit and there's an app that goes along with it, correct? There's two, there's the Career Toolkit app for free on the Android and iPhone stores and link from the website. Then we just put out a more general version called the Brain Bump app. At the time of this recording, it's still in beta, so bear with us. But the Brain Bump app, Brain Bump, two words on Android, right now on Apple, we got to get them to fix it. It's one word together. That has content not just from my book, but also from other books and podcasts, blogs, and talks that will help you develop your skills in leadership, networking, entrepreneurship, sales. All of these are there. And we put in the app because how often do you read a book, say, this is great, and then you forget it. The app will help you retain the information, whether it's the daily push notification we do to help you keep it top of mind, mm -hmm. or right before you walk into that networking event, you say, what were those networking skills? Pull it up in the app, look through them right before you walk in the room. So the Brain Bump app and the Career Toolkit app. Love it, love it. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you my questions, my fun questions, the VIP questions. Um, so if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, what three things or people would you bring with you? The professor, Skipper, and Marianne. <laughs> they did manage That's to probably... make it a long time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that reference might not work for some of the younger viewers. I would take with Google me it. certainly a doctor, an engineer, and probably someone who's just really good at farming or construction or whatever actual kind of work we need in the day-to-day. -day. I think that's a good plan right there, but I like your first answer better. <laughs> <laughs> what is one thing you do each morning to set your day up for success? I actually don't have a routine. I don't have a wake up and do this or check this or do that. I don't have a routine for my writing. I don't have a routine for my work. I just kind of do what feels right for the situation I'm in. Interesting. Interesting. We'll have to talk more about that offline. Okay. So my I final- I know that's very unusual. It, it, it really is. Um, my final VIP question for you. If your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? Loving husband and father impact on education and the business world. I love it. So very true. All of it. How do people find you? You can go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. There you can see where to buy the book and touch with me, follow me on social media. You can see additional articles I put out, get links to the Career Toolkit app on Android and iPhone. And there's that resources page with a number of free downloads, including the first one is on how to create that peer learning group. There's one on, we talked about how you don't know if in a company, what's the culture actually like? I have a list of questions you can ask and how to ask them during the interview so it Ugh. doesn't come off as awkward. That's gold That's right there. Careertoolkitbook.com. There's also the Brain Bump app. That's from Cognosco Media, C-O-G-N-O-S-C-O -O -O Media. But you can just look directly for Brain Bump on Android and Apple. So the careertoolkitbook.com and the Brain Bump app. I love it. Thank you so much for getting your ask in gear and reaching out when somebody recommended that you do it. A lot of times people get recommendations and they just don't follow through on them. So I think that speaks volumes about where you're at in your, your own career. Um, and I just have one last thing to say to you. You are a VIP. Thank you for having me on the show. And that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com. <laughs>